This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, guys. Today, we've got a special guest on the podcast. Her name is Christina Bennett. She writes for Live Action News, and she is also the communication director for the Family Institute of Connecticut. She is very, very passionate about the life issue, and has a lot to do with the fact that her mother actually told her that she once considered aborting Christina when she was pregnant with her. And so that, you know, she learned that as an adult, and that has really kind of springboarded her into this life where she's been dealing with this issue. So in this podcast, we get into a little bit more on that story. We're going to get into her reaction to the leak of Sam. Samuel Alito's draft opinion and his decision, also the Dobbs case and the overturning of that. But she has spent a majority of her life in this issue, you know, working in the issue of abortion, you know, regarding the black community. And I know I talked about on this show before that I don't really like talking about groups of people as if they're a homogenous group just because they look the same, have the same level of melanin. But I think in this case, you know, demographically, it makes sense because she has spent a lot of time talking about the abortion issue in the black community because it's three times higher than any other demographic in terms of race, the fatherlessness epidemic. And we dig into all that information. I really, really enjoyed my time with her. I think you guys are going to like her as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. Christina Bennett, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thank you for having me on. I'm absolutely happy to talk to you. I'm talking to a lot of people that kind of are in your world. And so I'm getting a lot of great feedback. It's going to be awesome for our audience. But in, in a way of introduction, let's just kind of start at the 30,000 foot view. What was it that got you specifically into the fight for life? In college, I found out that my mother had once scheduled and tried to abort me. I found out in a really unique way, somebody gave me a quote unquote kind of message, you know, from God. I was in a church service and someone told me, God wants you to know something remarkable happened around the time of your birth. So I asked my mom, hey mom, did something remarkable happen around the time of my birth? And to my great surprise, she said, yeah, I met an angel before you were born. I don't want to talk about it. She never said anything like that before. And amazingly, I left it alone because she was really serious when she said, I don't want to talk about it. So I thought, okay, I'll leave that alone. But I was in college and I, I was very curious. So of course, after a couple of months, I came back and said, what do you mean you met an angel before I was born? Well, come to find out the angel was a janitor in the hallway of the hospital where she was about to have an abortion. So she was being pressured by my dad. She was being coerced by my dad. He already had two kids at the time from two different women, didn't want a third, and he told her to get an abortion. She was actually going to a church, but her mentor told her, don't come back here, basically. She said, if you come back, I'll put my foot in the door and not let you in. She was just upset with her for being pregnant and not married. So she ended up going to Mount Sinai Hospital, Hartford, Connecticut, and she paid for the abortion. She met with a counselor in the hospital who told her this is the best decision, and that was about it. She didn't really get any counsel, and she was told to just go into the doctor's office, and she paused just for a moment between the counselor's office and the waiting room. And in that moment, this elderly African-American janitor saw her. She went up to her, looked her in the eyes and said, do you want to have this baby? And my mom said, yes. And she said, God will give you the strength to have this baby. It didn't end there because then she went to collect her stuff and the doctor called her into his office. He had blood on the floor from the last abortion that he never cleaned up. She was disgusted, as you can imagine. And... She told him, I want to leave. I want to keep my baby. And he said, no. He said, you've already paid for this. We're just nervous. And she said, no. And she continued to tell him that she wanted to keep me. And then he yelled at her and said, don't leave this room. But she ran out. She got married to my dad. It only lasted about a year. They got divorced. I went back and forth between them growing up. But when I was in my 20s, as I mentioned in college, I found that story out. And that was my first story or even any kind of experience with abortion. That was my first time because I just, I grew up in Connecticut where I live now. It's very pro-abortion. So 
we never talked about abortion at home. In high school, my friends, you could get an abortion and you don't have to tell your parents. We right. don't have parental notification laws in Connecticut. So I remember one of my friends getting an abortion and my only thought was, oh, man, her parents found out. That really stinks. Hmm. But other than that, I didn't have any sort of encounter, personal experience with it. So this was the first thing that was very personal to me. And it caused me to research and it caused me to want to know more. And the more I researched, the more I got involved. And eventually I ended up just saying yes to being in the pro-life movement. I think that's such an incredibly powerful story. And unfortunately, not a or I guess, fortunately, it's it's not a, a unique story. There are a lot of people that kind of have the story that, look, I was supposed to be aborted. Maybe it was a botched abortion or the mother changed her mind and, and now you're here. But I do want to kind of get into this because as I told you off air, the majority of the people that you're talking to today are male. This is like an 85, 90% male audience. And the pressure that men uh, enforce on women to kill their babies, uh, whether it's men that were directly involved in the, you know, uh, that baby being uh, created in the first place or fathers that don't want to, you know, have to admit to the guys down at the at the local cigar lounge. That, yeah, my, my, my little girl got knocked up or, or one of those types of things. Right. I live in a community that's pretty affluent and we have such a high abortion rate because it's these squeaky clean parents and families that right. want to make sure you don't think that their daughter's a skank. Like that's that's kind of the right. idea. And we have to kind of protect our our information. Talk a little bit more about the men because I, I'm flabbergasted at the uh, the cowardice that men show that are willing to literally shed blood so they don't have to be responsible. But I want to hear from your perspective about that as well because your dad obviously tried to make sure that happened with you. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I love to talk about that because it's so important. First of all, men have given into the lie that they don't have a voice on this particular issue. And that's not all their fault. I mean, that's society. Society has said no uterus, no opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of guys have said, well, you know, if you say that I don't have an opinion, then I'm going to wash my hands of it. And so you've got some men that are just apathetic and they don't care. They've washed their hands of it. They're happy to not have to be involved with it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other men like my dad, who, as you said, they are actively pressuring women. They are coercing them. They are telling them, you're going to do this or we're breaking up or you're getting kicked out of the house. I, I mean, I hate, uh, it's sad to even talk about, but just recently, only about a month ago, a 16 year old girl that I was, I don't know personally, but I was being, I was contacted about her and it was her father that was pressuring her to have the abortion. She wanted to keep this baby and she even went to a pregnancy center and with her dad and said, I think I can do this. And he said, well, what about this, this, and that? And she was like, I'll figure it out. And she figured out how she would be able to have a family member help her so she could finish school and the family member to watch the baby. But he kept on pressuring her, didn't think she could do it. And she got the abortion. And of course she felt really awful afterwards. And I think to myself, she's going to resent him, mm. especially when she gets older and she really understands the depth of what she did. There's going to be a lot of resentment there. And so as far back as Hugh Hefner, if you really want to go back in mm. uh, history, Hugh Hefner, you know, Playboy's founder, he supported Roe v. Wade immensely. All you have to do is Google Hugh Hefner and Roe v. Wade. And he was really proud to say that he was one of the first people before abortion was legalized to push for abortion rights. And he even wrote about it in Playboy. Now, why would someone like Hugh Hefner be so interested in so-called women's rights? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he was interested in you know so-called women's rights because he understood that this was a way for the women that he worked with to have, you know, free sex and, you know, sex, love and rock and roll without the consequences. And it would benefit men like him, men who wanted to use women, men who wanted to, to be able to go from one girl to the next girl. He understood that. And that's why he put money and time and effort behind Playboy. But you notice that the feminists in the 70s, like Gloria Steinem, they weren't, you know, walking in a march with you know, Hugh Hefner and lifting up his hands and walking with him. They wanted to distance themselves from people like that because they wanted to make it seem like it was all about women's rights and they were the ones at the forefront of the movement. But you also had men like 
Hugh Hefner, also at the forefront of the movement. Even earlier than that, in the 1930s, you had men like the Rockefellers and you had rich, white, elitist men who were racist, who were just pouring money into this abortion movement. Again, because they understood that it would allow them a certain amount of so-called freedom, allow them to be you know, liberal and free with their sexuality. And by them doing that, it really put all of the burden on women. And so prior to Roe versus Wade being legalized in society, when a woman got pregnant, that burden was almost on the man's shoulders more than the woman, because society would say to the man, you have to marry this girl. Like you have to get this right. You have to marry this girl. And then it switched when abortion became legalized. Then there was no real pressure anymore for the man to be responsible and marry this girl. All of a sudden the pressure went on the woman that she's got to do something about it. An interesting fact that people may not know is that the number one cause of death for pregnant women is homicide. Yeah. And there is such a large growing amount of pregnant women who are killed by their partners. Part of the reason they're killed by their partners is because if they refuse to have an abortion or they say, you know, I'm keeping this baby, the partner will kill them and the baby. And if you look into these stories, it happens all of the time. It happens every year. Multiple times it's happening. There was a football player who killed a cheerleader, and he literally said to the news, and they were in high school, he said, she refused to have an abortion, so I had to take care of it myself. He had to take care of it himself, meaning he had to kill her and kill the baby. But where does that mindset come from? It comes from this idea that I have been taught by society that a baby is an inconvenience to my life, to my freedom. And therefore, I can use violence towards the baby, but then I can also use violence towards the woman. And that can be subtle pressure all the way to murder. I think it's so, so many great points there. But I, as you were saying that, like people don't understand where the term shotgun wedding comes from is because, you know, someone gets a woman pregnant and the dad's basically, that's the mental image. The dad's leading that young boy down the aisle with a shotgun in his back saying, you're going to take care of this girl and you're going to take care of this baby. But you're absolutely right. Womanizers, they love abortion. Rapists love abortion. Irresponsible little boys that can shave. Some people would call them men, even though people on the left can't even define the difference between a male and a female. They love abortion because it gets them to where it's like, they're thinking to themselves, man, how is this baby going to affect how much halo I get to play or how many fantasy football leagues that I get to enter into or how many, you know, this, that, or the other, how many rounds of golf I'm going to be able to play. It's such a selfish culture that we live in. And so like changing the attitude around that, I mean, that that's part of the thing that, and we're going to talk a lot about the Dobbs decision. There are so many things that we need to work on in this area. And it's not just getting laws changed. It's getting hearts changed. That's why I I tell people all the time. It's like, you need the gospel in these people's hearts because it's like, that's going to change their desires. They're not going to desire to kill their babies because they're not going to desire themselves over the life that they've helped to create. And one of the great things about you and the work that you do as you work with one of our favorite organizations uh, here at Undaunted Life, and that's Live Action. So you work with a lot yeah. of different organizations, but you are specifically over there. I believe you're kind of with their news yeah. wing, and that, that kind of helps with you know setting the record yeah. straight on a lot of these things because they do a lot of great things on social media. They've had a big, large impact. So I guess, tell me how you got hooked up with them over there because we love Lila. She's been on the, the show twice. We love supporting what you all are doing. But y'all had some very interesting things come out here even recently. And I'm also kind of curious to see the stuff that y'all are going to be focusing on now as a group group now that, you know, the Dobbs decision has come down. Yes. So I've been working with live action, you know, kind of part-time freelancing for probably about maybe seven years or so. (laughs) I started writing articles for them and I really appreciated the excellence in which they, they do everything. Just, I've seen a lot in the pro-life movement. I've been involved for 17 years and they were just, you know, kind of above reproach do everything really well and have a lot of integrity and character and they don't get into the drama. You know, they're not into infighting or different things, dramatic things. They're just about the main thing. They make the main thing, the main thing, which is saving lives. And so I really respected them as an organization and they asked me to write for them. And then just during the pandemic, I had done different projects for them, interviews and 
different things, but they asked me if I would come on as a, a spokesperson, a news correspondent, and do interviews, do podcasts, do news stuff. And I said that I would be happy to do that. And so I've been doing that about maybe a year or so now, and it's been really wonderful. Some of the projects that we've been working on recently, we just released a series on abortion procedures where we're actually, we have four female former abortion doctors. The first series we did was with a male former abortion doctor, Dr. Levitano, and he goes through all the different types of abortions and why he left. And he's got a really compelling story about why he left. If people haven't watch those videos, I would encourage them to go to our YouTube and watch them. And those were wildly successful. Millions of people watched those videos. So we followed them up with Abortion Procedures 2.0. And these are four former abortion doctors that are women that have left the industry. And we have these really well done, medically accurate animations that we use. And they're not overly graphic, but they do get the point across as to what really happens in an abortion. And so those are in the video, as well as we just did an undercover video that we released about a couple of weeks ago. And it focuses on the abortion clinic in Washington, D.C., the surgery center. And it focuses on this really sick abortionist called Dr. Santangelo. Mm-hmm. This guy is really a piece of work. I mean, he, we believe that he's, possibly, very possibly, doing late-term abortions. There were five babies that were recently found by pro-life activists, and they were given a medical waste box, and the babies were in it. And they were like late-term babies that had been aborted. And we've been calling for the medical examiner to look into it. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened. But we sent somebody in undercover. And shockingly, the nurse was talking to our undercover person. And when she said, you know, pretending to be a 28 week pregnant woman, she said, can I talk to the doctor about this procedure? And the nurse said, not until you take a Xanax. What? And she was like, why do I need to take a Xanax? Yes. Why do I need to take a Xanax in order to talk to the doctor? And she, the nurse literally says, and people can watch this. I'm not even exaggerating. He won't talk to you until your pants off on the table after taking a Xanax. And it's just shocking to watch. Like, Forget, you know, medical consent that just flies out the window. Literally, he wants them to be drugged before they can even ask questions of him. It's frightening because we caught that on video. In the beginning, she asked too, the nurse, she says, well, I'm 28 weeks along. I'm sure you guys don't really see people this far. And the nurse is like, oh, no, we do. We see people this far all the time. So it's really disturbing, but I would encourage people to watch that. And that work that we did with that particular video, it just goes right along with what Lila and the team has done from the beginning, going undercover, exposing sex trafficking, exposing criminal activity, exposing racism, where we've made phone calls into Planned Parenthoods and said, could we give money earmarked for a black baby to be aborted? Because we really were against affirmative action and we want less black babies. And they're like, yes, absolutely. Whatever the reason is, we'll take the money. So we've done some pretty crazy investigations, but they are eye-opening and shocking, the things that we've uncovered. I'm so glad that you all do that work as well, because it's so easy for the propaganda wing of the Democratic Party, otherwise known as the mainstream media, to basically ignore these stories or to present their spin to it. It's like, oh, we don't know if this is accurate, because as soon as the pictures came out from that clinic of these babies that were late term, uh, you know, children that were killed, like most of these people are like, oh, look, that those pictures were taken in someone's apartment. We don't even know that's where they came from. And like for that clinic, I mean, are they not on on high alert right now that they're in the crosshairs of this? The only way that you get a nurse to be able to just talk so casually about this stuff is because they don't care because they feel like they're not, no one's going to investigate them. There is so much beneath right. the surface on this that that it's going to be hard uh, to kind of get into, but I know you all will keep digging, but we will make sure all that is in the show notes so you guys can check that out. But obviously I wanted to talk to you today because I wanted to talk about the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization decision that came down on June the 24th of 2022. One of the greatest days in the history of the United States. That's where Dobbs was upheld by 6-3 decision. And most importantly, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey was overruled in a 5-4 decision because Justin Roberts is a yellow-bellied jerk who sucks and I hate him. But, you know, we we were able to get it. Thank you, Amy Coney Barrett. We were able to make sure that that kind of went through. So I guess I have two questions for you about just some initial responses. So what was your reaction 
to the Politico leak of Alito's draft decision that came out weeks and weeks before the actual decision? And then what was your reaction like to the announcement that Roe and Casey were now dead? Well, for the leak, I had mixed emotions because I was furious that some clerk or someone would would leak this. I, and I, I didn't think the Biden administration would find the person, which they haven't. And I didn't think that they would be held accountable. And I knew that whoever did that was trying to intimidate the justices, which is exactly what we saw play out. Someone tried to kill Justice Kavanaugh, you know, comes to his house trying to kill him. And of course, they're outside of Amy Coney Barrett's house and they're harassing them. And so that part really frustrated me because we've never seen this happen before, you know, in in history. I've never seen this happen in my lifetime where there's been a leak in a document. And so that upset me. But at the same time, I was filled with hope. Like, are we really here? Like, is this happening? I believe that it's happening. We've been hoping and praying, but it looks like this is it. And so I just automatically, I started a fast. I just, <laughs> I was like, I'm starting a fast for like a couple weeks or something. You know, I wanted to, I said I was going to fast until the Supreme Court decision, but then, you know, I think a couple weeks and I started eating sweets, but, yeah. but still, um, that was my immediate response. But then when I heard about the the Dobbs decision being Roe being overturned, I was just sobbing. I mean, I was just, you can, people can go to my Instagram, black pro-life woman, and you can see my sobbing face. Like <laughs> I literally just sobbed and sobbed and I posted it on Instagram and I just wanted people to know that I was just crying and maybe they were crying too and, and they wouldn't feel alone, but I was sobbing. It was just so emotional. If, if your listeners have ever seen the movie Amazing Grace, it tells the story of William Wilberforce and the slave trade in Britain. And there's a particular scene at the end of the film where everyone's gathered together and they, you know, they release the vote and he realizes that he's won and, and people just start clapping and he's just looking up. He's just so amazed and he's grateful and he's kind of in shock. And I always wanted that moment. I always wanted that moment. I would watch that film and say, God, give me that moment with the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And although I wasn't in a room full of people, you know, clapping for me, I definitely felt, I think, a bit of what he must have felt in that moment, just that kind of gratitude for for seeing a victory of that magnitude. I, I got to be honest with you. I'm a very pessimistic person. I never thought this was going to happen, even during the Trump administration. Uh, when I was doing the math, um, you know, I was like, I, I think I even said I wasn't sure if Alito would vote for this. I knew Thomas would, and I figured ACB would, but I was like, man, I don't really know about Kavanaugh. I don't really know about Gorsuch. We know Justice Roberts is the worst. So, like, what what can we actually? And I was, I remember doing that math, and I love it when I'm wrong on things like yeah. this, I love it so much whenever I come out with egg on my face. And, but I, I was the same way as, as you, Christina, like I was on a lawnmower when a buddy called me, he's like, Hey man, that's crazy news, huh? He thought I already knew, but I was like busy wow. that morning. Like, and so he was the one that broke the news to me and I'm sitting there in the hundred degree heat in Oklahoma mowing a lawn. And I'm just like overwhelmed. And I came up immediately right. and, and recorded a podcast and I got choked up myself and I'm not a terribly emotional guy, but it's just like, man, like, then you start being filled with gratitude, not just to God, but right. to Donald Trump. Like God drew a straight line with a crooked right. stick with that man, right. my God. But then also <laughs> the 50 years worth of men and women and children that have dedicated their lives to this cause, many of them right. have passed away. They didn't get to experience this day. It's almost like when, you know, a silly example, but like when Cubs fans, they don't win the World Series for over a hundred years. And then, you know, their, right. their grandpa died having never seen a, a Cubs World Series, but the grandson got right. to experience it. It almost felt like that, even though I hate the Cubs, and I hope they never win another World Series ever again. But that's not what we're talking about. It kind of felt it felt that important that like I'm so glad that we're right. living through history. But with all that excitement and in a, in a, elation, and I told guys celebrate. It's Friday night. You know, I drank you know a new bottle of whiskey and smoked a cigar and had a good time. But by Saturday morning, it's like okay, it's time to sober up. Let's make sure that we understand that the fight has begun for real now. And so that's really right. one of the main reasons I wanted you on today, Christina. Is so yeah. Roe v. Wade is dead. Now what? Well, you you summed it up well. And I did the same thing. You know, my husband and I, like we went out to celebrate, you know, we had dinner. And then as you said, it's like, okay, let's let's get our, you know, our, our focus on. And for me, it, I've been this way for a long time, so it doesn't necessarily change, but 
I think it's important right now for people to first understand what is happening in your particular state. Mm -hmm. And you have to know what's happening. So I can speak for Connecticut for myself. Tragically, we are a pro-abortion state. I know which legislators are pro-abortion, which ones are pro-life. We just passed legislation allowing midwives and APRNs to perform abortions. And the ones who are pro-choice, they have heard from me. Trust. Like, mm. they have heard from me. I have uh, testified against them. I have, you know, exposed their connections to NARAL and the abortion industry. I have petitioned them. I have emailed them. And so what is happening in your state? If you are in New York, if you're in California, if you're one of these in one of these liberal states, mostly, you know, blue, uh, blue states, do you know the people who are pushing for even more abortion access? And have they heard from you? Have you written them? Have you called them? Have, you know, because if you haven't, know that Planned Parenthood is. Planned Parenthood is, they have lobbyists, they have people that are walking up and down the floors of the Capitol buildings, and they are trying to strengthen abortion laws, even by writing abortion into some state constitutions. So that's very important. If you're in a pro-life state and you're seeing abortion banned, that's awesome. And you should be very grateful. At the same time, you need to ask yourself a couple things. One, with an increase of women who are pregnant and may not have resources, how am I helping them to get resources? So do you know your closest pregnancy resource center? Do you know what's going on there? One that you would recommend to other women if they came to you in need. What's happening at your church? What's happening with your community? If you run into a pregnant girl in the supermarket and she's crying and she says, I can't do this. My boyfriend's abusive. He's kicking me out. Like I have nowhere to go. I can't live at home. You know, do you know where to send her? Or are you going to just be in shock and, and say, oh, you know, here's a couple bucks. I don't know what to do for you. So we need to know. We need to be informed. We need to be equipped. We need to take responsibility because for close to 50 years, we've been looking at the Supreme Court like, okay, you guys do your job. And now they did their job. And so it's like, okay, the ball's in our court and we have to be ready to fight. And you got people on the left, like AOC, who's one of the loudest voices, and she is going on talk shows and she's very clearly saying, this is what I want to do. We have to elect this person and that person. We have to pass something in Congress. They have a Women's Health Protection Act that they want to pass. It passed through the House. It didn't pass through the Senate, but she's got a plan and she is making it very clear what her plan is. And so we don't have to live in fear and we don't have to worry necessarily that, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to change tomorrow, but we also can't afford to be idle. And I think whenever you see a victory, sometimes people feel like, okay, it's a victory. And now I can kind of rest in that. And you can in your heart to say, I'm so grateful for this. And I, I feel just, you know, like this will be something that's lasting. But at the same time, you really have to fight to sustain that win, to sustain that battle. Well, and also it's time to gird your loins and to realize like, hey, the, the fight is really about to kick off because right. this idea, because again, they thought they settled the abortion issue. The the seven Supreme Court justices that decided Roe in the 70s, they thought they had settled the issue, but all they did was to basically create the pro-life movement. It, it had been in existence before Roe v. Wade, but they right. really kind of made it a national issue for people that didn't think we should kill babies that are in the womb. But for for churches, for conservatives, for people that live in states that are kind of squishy, you know, in between kind of purple states, this is that time for you to make your voice heard because you can't keep lamenting on social media and not vote. You can't keep lamenting right. on social media, but not calling your congressperson or right. sending them an email or trying to get a meeting or any of those types of things. And so there are very, very good ways inside of our system to make sure our voices are heard. But this has opened up a lot of eyes, especially Christians, because like, Christians like me, we never thought that this was going to be overturned, but most Christians haven't thought about the issue as much as I have. And so they don't know about pregnancy resource centers. They don't know that almost 100% of them were started by Christians and are maintained right. by Christians and Christian money and all those different things. Churches like the church that I attend, you could tell they got caught flat-footed because on the Sunday after the Dobbs decision, they were like, okay, we're, we're going to kind of figure this out. We're going to figure out and make sure that you guys know the resources you need because they never really thought that this would ever happen. And so I like what I'm seeing now. People are like, okay, I want to get into the fight. 
But I want to kind of go back to something that I, I mentioned earlier, and that's, you know, spreading the gospel and changing the hearts of people, changing the desires, because some people are saying we need to focus on making abortion unthinkable. But what they mean is a Trojan horse for we need universal health care and universal uh, child care and, you know, paid maternity leave and all this other stuff, all these lefty policy prescriptions, but making it unthinkable in the hearts of man. And one thing that you've talked about a lot and is, you know, right there in your, your Instagram handle is abortion, but also fatherlessness inside the black community. Now, as I've said a lot on this show, I don't like talking about groups of people as if they're this homogenous group of people that just because they look the same, they act the same, but it is impossible to ignore the abortion rates inside of the community uh, of the black community and also inside uh, the fatherlessness inside that community as well. So I don't really even have a question for you. I just know you've done a lot of thinking and a lot of talking on this. And so to tell me what your thoughts are, because this is kind of Margaret Sanger's playbook that's playing out right before our eyes. It's like, make me, you know, make the government daddy and also make sure we can kill as many black babies as possible. And for the last 50 years, her plan has been working really, really well. Go. Right. So I have so many thoughts on this and it is complicated. I have to say I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative but it is not so black and white, so to speak. So for example, um, you know, I support social services. I think social services are important. At the same time, you wanna make sure that you're not creating an over-dependency on services that would cause you to become stuck. So when I worked for the pregnancy centers, for example, on one hand, I was so grateful, because I live in Connecticut, so I was so grateful when I could call a, you know, the hotline 211, and I could connect somebody with, you know, a shelter or a woman's home. Now, granted, Connecticut really doesn't have that many. So we're not doing as good as people may think, like our legislators may think. There's a Christian or Catholic maternity home that closed down because the state didn't fund it, but they fund Planned Parenthood every year. But still, I used to think, no, all charity just has to come through the church. But then I realized that the church isn't yet doing all that it's supposed to do. So when I had a pregnant girl in front of me and she was like, I need resources, I could call churches day and night, but I wasn't really getting what I needed to. So I was grateful for some government support. At the same time, I would see some girls come in and they would literally say to me, I would say, you know, what's your plan? And they would say, oh, well, I'm just going to wait to, you know, I'm going to get on section eight, like my parents, or I'm going to do this. And I would say, you know, that's not realistic. Do you realize how long the waiting list is for that? Or I would see just a dependency that was unhealthy. So they've been on different social services for so many years that they've never gotten their license or they could be working, but they're not working or the system punishes them for getting married. So right. they know that if they get married, they're going to lose services. So therefore they won't get married. They'll just be living together. And so I've seen both of those things where it's like, God, yes, we need help. We need services, but which ones do we need? And how do we help people without enabling them? I think that's a big conversation that we have to have. And I don't have any easy answers because there, there's no easy answers and they'll look different in every state. When it comes to the black community in abortion, tragically, as you mentioned, and as many people know, abortions, you know, the roots of Planned Parenthood was racism and population control and eugenics. Margaret Sanger had a Negro project. She wanted to rid the earth of undesirables. She didn't want black people re reproducing after their own kind. And so she really targeted our community and we're obviously still suffering to this day because of that, with abor our abortion rates being three times higher than any other race and with a majority of these clinics in lower income minority neighborhoods. But what's happened, I think, in 50 years is that abortion has become almost like a necessary evil to many in the Black community. And even after Roe was overturned, I saw it more. I saw silence across the entire church, white churches, Black churches. I saw silence with everybody. But I guess I noticed the silence more from the Black Christians because they're often quite vocal when it comes to civil rights issues, human rights issues, Black Lives Matter, different things. And so the same people that I notice that can be vocal, you know, whether that's putting a Black square up, you know, on Instagram for something, whether that's marching, you know, they're silent on this issue. And 
it really hurt me to see that. Thankfully, my pastor is black and I go to a mostly black church. My pastor was like, let's talk about this. I mean, he mm-hmm. literally had me come up on Sunday and talk about it. And I thank God for that. But he's the exception. Dr. Tony Evans is a black pastor. He spoke about it, but many have not. And a lot of our African-American papers and magazines like Essence and Ebony, they're coming out with articles and stories supporting Planned Parenthood, supporting the abortion industry. And we've just believed the lie for so long that these industries are there to help us. That is what they say. And we've we believed it and we've internalized it. And now we're doing the work for them. In the beginning, Sanger was trying to get people to kill us. And now we've internalize that message that, yeah, it's, you know what, we might not say it out loud, but we think it. Yeah. Yeah. If our child's born and we're a single mom, you know what, maybe it's better to choose abortion. If, if my child's going to be born and I can't take care of them and they might go into foster care, maybe it's better to choose abortion. And it's really tragic. Now at the same time, we have a really high percentage of single moms. I grew up in a family of single moms and Listen, my mom and my aunts could run circles around me to this day. <laughs> I mean, they really could. They they cook better than me. They clean better than me. They're more organized than me. I mean, the list goes on and on. They are superhero women. But I think part of that mentality that we have, we're, and myself as a woman, you know, where we grow up and we think like, I was raised by single moms. They can do it all. Um, that's not a good mentality to have. And it's out of brokenness that many of us think this way, but it allows us to stay stuck and to stay dependent, you know, on these industries that are making money off of us. They're profiting from our pain. If you look at the black community throughout history, but especially recent history, like the civil rights movement, you will see that the power and the strength, it always came from the church. It came from Christian leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King came from leaders like Jesse Jackson before he sold out. And, you know, he used to be pro-life. He was like one of the pro-life voices. If you, if you Google Jesse Jackson pro-life, he was writing for national right to life. He even said, and quote, what will happen 20 years from now if we continue to abort children without even a pang in our conscience. He ran for president in the 1980s and he sold out and betrayed the black community running as a Democrat. He had to become pro-choice, but he used to be a prophetic pro-life voice. But again, the power was in the church. And so for us to, as the black community, for us to go forward and for us to be liberated from this covenant of death, we have to speak truth from the pulpit. We have to break ties with Planned Parenthood. We have to expose them. We have to do this. It can't just be another people group trying to do it on our behalf. We have to have leaders in our own community. So I'll say, you know, in closing to this particular question, um, I would recommend that people check out groups like Pro Black, Pro Life, check out groups like the Ann Campaign's Whole Project, Whole Life Project, uh, the National Black Pro Life Coalition, leaders like Dean Nelson, Ben Watson, he's a former football player for the Patriots. Um, He's a very strong voice. And again, you know, and I'll say this too, because if this is a you know mostly people that are conservative that are listening, some of these people are going to have different opinions than you might have on things like social services or how to get ahead. But don't discount their voice because they are literally the only ones speaking in the black community. I mean, we've got you know black conservatives like myself, like Alveda King, like Ryan Bomberger, like Dean Nelson, but still, any black man or woman who is willing to come out and be strong on this issue. You may not agree 100% with them, but listen to them because their voices are really important. We need a million more voices like that in order for us to really get to where we need to be. I think that's an important point because specifically I've been asked to look into the and campaign before. And whenever I looked into some of the stuff that said, I'm like, oh, some of this is pretty rough. Like, And so I think 
again, I agree with your point that, you know, again, crooked sticks can be drawn, you know, straight, you know, straight lines can be drawn with crooked sticks, but God has to kind of have an idea and a, an impact in that. And so I think having right theology matters here in terms of you know, when you have someone like a, a supposed pastor, like Raphael Warnock coming out immediately, basically saying, no, we need to make sure we can protect people's rights. It's like, that's a the theological problem. Okay. Like that is a heart problem. <laughs> Him. Don't listen to that guy. <laughs> right. And so like that, that's just a guy that's an, an example of, you know, a black community leader, if you can even couch it that way of a guy that runs Martin Luther King Jr.'s church now that is, is saying these incredibly heinous things that are a biblical, that are basically anti what, what God would have us do. But <clears throat> there's one thing, and, and I don't know that this is true. And, and I'm not a big Trump MAGA MAGA guy. Like I voted for him in 2020, but I didn't vote for him in 2016. Like I like to call balls and strikes with that guys, but the Christians and the black Christians and the black church, the people that were silent, that weren't standing up and, and screaming and shouting and throwing confetti around whenever the Dobbs decision came down. I'm wondering if part of the hesitancy was that they would have to acknowledge that the horrible, evil orange man did something right whenever he got on Gorsuch, Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. And that they would have to kind of admit for a second, like, I hate that man. I think he's a racist. I think he's the worst. He's a horrible sinner and all these things. But Look at this thing that he did. That was pretty cool. Like, do you think that ha that right. plays into a little bit? Because I know, I know well, Trump made inroads into the quote unquote black community, but there's still, that is a voting block that goes anti anything Trump would ever say or do. Yeah. So that's a good question. So I want to say one thing too, about uh, what you said before, before I answer that. So with someone like uh, Reverend Warnock, you know, we need discernment and wisdom. You can say that you're a reverend. But if you're clearly out there promoting abortion and I mean, not only promoting abortion, but if you look into his history, not that I'm trying to tear him down or anything, but it's very clear. Well, I think it's clear. There's a lot of stories about the way that he's particularly treated his ex-wife and, and she's said that he tried to run over her foot and different things. And God knows what's true or not true. You know, I know those things can be complicated, but I do think that even on his pro-abortion stand alone, you see that there is something that's really faulty. Whereas, you know, the ant campaign, they might say things that are uncomfortable for people to hear, or even things that people may not agree with. Um, but I know from personally working with them on the side that they have this whole life project and they have people, I don't agree with everything, you know, because I have a different, you know, political viewpoint, but I know they're really trying to reach women and families. That being said, with President Trump, I have a unique I had a unique experience with President Trump. I got to meet President Trump. I got to go to the White House mm. and to meet him. I was in the Oval Office. I was very opposed to President Trump before he got into office because I thought, well, I mean, I listened to him. Yeah, right? yeah, right. <laughs> I thought a lot of things about the way that he talked about women and different things. I prayed intensely and I, I God gave me a dream that he was going to win. And I'm, I'm very firm on that. I, I believe it was God. He gave me a dream he was going to win. He told me to vote for him. I, I voted for him both times. I was actually on the board for Pro-Life Voices for Trump. I It was not a um, picture-perfect, rosy you know, thing with me because there were times that he said things that caused me a lot of pain personally, even as a Black woman. But for me, it was all about the Supreme Court. I had, I mean, of course, it was religious liberty too. Of course, it was you know, a bunch of different things, but it was, I had my eyes like laser focused on the court. And so when people would say to me, Christina, Trump's not really pro-life. I would say, well, I know Hillary's definitely not pro-life. And so he's saying that he is pro-life. At least I have a shot, you know, there's a shot. Let's see if he keeps his promises. And well, we know that he kept his promises with, with that. I don't know if people in the black community, I mean, let's be real. Of course I know my own family, my own family multiple times, you know, said that they thought Trump was Hitler. So, um, yeah. you know, when I went to the White House, oh boy. you know, my own family members were not <laughs> happy about that. I mean, they were upset about that. Why are you going to go see Hitler? So I definitely felt the pressure for those years when I was vocally supporting him because I was vocal about it and I felt that pressure. So I know a lot of people just hated him, hated him with a passion. He had the unique just power and ability to really like unite people to hate him or unite people to love yeah. him. I, I honestly never seen anything like it. Just if you said Trump, that you support him, people were like, we support you. And if, if you hated him, people were also with you on that. But anyway, that could be part of the reason. 
that people just don't want to acknowledge that. But I also think it's deeper than that. I think they really, some people in the black community really don't see it fully as a win because of a few things. One, there is so, we're, we're so polarized. And so a lot of people in the black community, they don't trust the motives of mostly white politicians. They don't trust that their intent is that they really care about black lives or even really care about black babies. So therefore they want them to succeed and flourish. And that's why they're ending abortion. They don't trust that because they don't see it played out in other areas. So in their mind, they think there's no way you sincerely just care about black babies because if you cared about black people, you'd care about police brutality, you'd care about um, you know, housing, you'd care about Flint and the water crisis in Michigan. And so therefore you don't care. So there's this lack of trust and they most of them have not seen what I've seen. So I've traveled across the country and I've been to mostly white events, pregnancy center banquets. And I have seen white people um, that, yeah, they may, you know, if I was following their social media accounts, maybe they would say things that offend me. Maybe we wouldn't see eye to eye on different issues. Maybe they'd be insensitive about race, but they're opening up their pocketbooks and they're giving really hundreds of thousands of dollars to pregnancy resource centers, which then go fund this and, and support, you know, black and brown women. So I see this as a black woman. I see this. This helps me balance out whatever the media is is highlighting. But your average black person, they're not, they're not seeing that. Like they're not traveling across the country and going to pregnancy center banquets. They're not in these circles. And then of course we filter our news, we filter our social media. So if they're just following, you know, black politicians or black leaders and and which, you know, nothing wrong with that, but they're hearing one side of the story. And if they don't trust white Republicans, they don't trust white conservatives, they're always thinking, what is the motive? What is the motive? Now, sometimes it literally makes no sense. Like I've had multiple people come to me and say, oh, you know, the only reason that, you know, white legislators are passing these things is because they want, you know, there to be more white people because the white birth is going down. They want there to be more white people. But I say, I was just, Someone just said this to me or, you know, they're racist. And I said, well, do you understand, right? That like when abortion's banned, there will be more black babies. Like, so if you were really racist, why would you be wanting to ban something that would cause for there to be more black babies? But again, it's not always logical because sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes there's pain involved. So that's part of the reason that there's a lack of trust. There's, uh, they don't trust the motives. And then the second thing is, which is connected to the first, that, they just don't think that they're going to help the women that they say they're going to help. So they say, yeah, you'll ban abortion, but are you going to help the women find resources? Are you going to help them uh, carry their pregnancies, you know, all, all the way to term and then afterwards? And again, if they don't know about the pregnancy centers, if they don't know about maternity homes, if they don't trust those places, because you have to remember that these magazines, Ebony, Essence, they're doing hit pieces on pregnancy right. centers. So we can come and say, oh, well, yeah, there's 2000 pregnancy resource centers, but they might say, oh, you mean those fake clinics, those fake clinics that, you know, Ebony magazine said to watch out for literally there's articles directly saying why black women should be concerned about pregnancy centers. So it's really, there's a lot of indoctrination and miseducation and lies and, and I, I could even give you two recent examples. So there was a senator, you may have heard this. Um, I think his name was like John Corrin or something. I can't remember his name. And Barack Obama made a statement on Twitter about the overturning of Roe versus Wade and precedent, precedent um, being overturned you know, wrongly. And so this white senator, he responded on Twitter and he said, now do Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education. Mm. So Sean King, who is, I don't know if Sean King's biracial or no one white, technically or I don't, I don't knows, know he, but it's a mystery. No one knows, right? But Sean King, he took that to tw his own Instagram account and he posted the tweet from the Senator and he goes, look at what he just said. And I looked through the comments and I was just floored because people only saw the Brown versus board of education part of it. 
And Sean King did not explain it. And so the majority of Sean King's audience thought that in that tweet, that white senator who's pro-life was saying, let's overturn the Brown versus Board of Education decision next. Now, in fact, when I saw it, I quickly like for a moment was confused too. Like what, 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 what is he, why is he mentioning Brown versus Board of Education? What is he saying? Would he be so bold to say something like that? Well, then I do my research. So I go over to Twitter and there's actually a black guy in his comment section who was like, he's not even pro-life. He's like, guys, listen, I'm pro-choice, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying that Brown versus Board of Education overturned the precedent of Plessy versus Ferguson. And that's a positive example of how established law can be overturned. And he was correcting Barack Obama and saying that this was also a positive example. But Sean King never, and there's things I like about Sean King, you know, there's different things that I like about him. There's things that I don't. I try to listen to people on both sides and try to find, you know, the good in them and whatever. I try to be a bridge builder. But I was so just, saddened that he let this stand and so many people. And then since that moment, I've had at least two to three other black leaders um, in conversations who are pro-life bring that exact tweet up to me as an example and, and wonder like, why would this guy say that? And then I, you know, explain, I, I don't think that's what he was trying to say. I think he was just trying to say that it's okay to overturn established law. And he was using that as an example. The other thing was that white woman who was with Trump at a rally and she said, you know, we thank God that like for this ruling that we can like protect um, white life. And I think she meant to say the right, <laughs> right. to life, but she said <laughs> white life. And, you know, grant, I mean, I'm not out here as a black person just trying to make excuses for white people. So sometimes I don't even talk about this stuff. So I feel like they're going to think, oh, I'm just a black conservative trying to make excuses for white people. And I'm not trying to do that. But I do try to be fair. And I think to myself, I don't think that she was right. saying that. I think that she accidentally said that. She meant to say right to life. Now, how did she not catch it? God only knows. How did she not correct herself? God only knows. But I also know as a speaker what it's like to oh, be yeah. in front of an audience to people, you know, you've got a microphone, you say something, you think, oh my God, what did I say? So, but those two examples, they spread like wildfire, wildfire through social media. I'm talking about thousands of people were like, look at this. This lady said, protect white life. Look at this. This white senator wants to overturn Brown versus Board of Education. And so it reminds me of what happened with that, um, young guy. I think his name was Nick at the March for Life years ago when he ran to the Native right. American. You remember that he ran to the Native American and everybody saw one side of the story and they like, you know, had to shut down his school because they were attacking his school and come to find out it was a completely different story. And so we have to understand that the media and, you know, demonic forces and all sorts of things, people, they're, they're really trying to keep people bound with deception and lies. And so it's important for us to understand that and then for us to try to build bridges wherever we can. And that might, I mean, the easiest way to do that is having relationships with actual, you know, black people. And then in those relationships, being able to say, Hey, well, what do you think about this? Or have you thought about it from this perspective and, and really kind of breaking through the lies because as a community, we've always cared about family We've always cared about children. Many black grandparents have adopted their own children, uh, their mm -hmm. grandkids when their the moms haven't been able to do that. You know, kinship adoptions. We have a beautiful culture that loves, you know, family. But sadly, you know, we we've just been targeted and we've believed so many different lies over the years. Well, and something that you said uh, earlier when you were talking about the reason why you voted for uh, Trump in 2016 was because of the Supreme Court. I remember not being compelled by that argument at the time. Like I've mentioned my uncle Dan on this show several times. He's like, Kyle, I don't like Trump either, but the Supreme Court's too important. And I was, you know, on this stance that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they do not make, meet my basic standards of human decency. I can't vote for right. either of them. And then here we are. So, but just think about it. And I know that all the same cases wouldn't have gone there, but let's say Hillary Clinton had gotten three picks on the Supreme Court. Right. And I think that the, the number would have been seven to liberal majority at that point or right. something like that. Right. 
how much different of a country would we have right now? The you know, Supreme Court was on a heater. Like it wasn't just Dobbs at the end of their session. There was right. a couple of cases that had to do with religious liberty, you right. know, with the EPA. Right. There was a lot of stuff that happened, which if you didn't have, it's really only a 5-4 majority because again, Justice Roberts is the worst. But it's like, even with a 5-4, you can do a lot of good for this country uh, with with a 5-4 majority like that. And like the, the country would be right. so un unbelievably different. But we'll wrap up with, with this question for today. So- I understand what I look like and I understand. So I grew up in a very, very diverse city in Southwest Oklahoma, Lawton, Oklahoma. We had Fort Sill right there. Like I grew up with more people of color in my classes than people that look like me, which is not common for every community right. in Oklahoma or every community in the country for that matter. And so it's like, talking to people that don't look like me, that don't have the same background, whose uh, grandmother calls them different names than my grandmother called me. I always thought that was great. That was just part of who I was growing up. But I do understand that someone will look at me not knowing a thing about me and say, well, I I'm not going to listen to that guy. Look at him, right? Yeah. And it's something that you already obviously talked about. Like there's this distrust from these people, um, you know, people that are people of color towards the people that right. are in Congress that are like, oh, don't, don't worry. I'll take care of you. And it's like, well, they've heard that before. That community of people have heard that before. So moving forward, because uh, since you're talking to a lot of conservative Christians on this podcast, you know, I'm assuming most of them are white. I've never looked at my demographic information there. But when you're talking to these communities that need a revolution, right? In right. their hearts, specifically on this issue, not about everything, not about school choice, not about taxation, right. not about any of that stuff, but specifically on the right to life for unborn children. What is it that we can do better as opposed to, yeah, of course, have friends that look like everybody don't have a particular kind of friend, but some people live in communities where they just live with a, you know, they live in a community with a lot of Latino people. They live in a community with a lot of white people. It just happens to be that way. What are ways from, from, from my microphone to your Instagram that people can like say, Hey, this isn't about race. This is about the unborn people that need our protection. Well, that's a great question. So I would say we have to start with, you know, being self-aware of how do I, and this is, it's not easy. It's very, very hard. So I'm just putting it out there. And if someone really wants to do this, it's going to cost them because <laughs> it's very hard. Asking yourself, you know, how do I sound to black people around me? If, if I'm on social media, if I'm on Facebook and I have black friends or I have black acquaintances and they're looking at my posts, how do I sound? How do I think I sound to them? Because you don't really know, but how do I think that I, that I come off to them? And just considering that, you know, when we share things, and the reason I mentioned that something as simple as social media is because a lot of times when people are looking at you from a distance and they're seeing something in you, they're making judgments about you before they even enter into a relationship with you. Or they, they look at something you said and they might think, okay, well, this person is not someone I could trust. This person is not safe. This person doesn't care. And that causes them to perhaps... Um, cut you off, unfriend you, or, or just not ever want to really go deeper with you. And so being mindful of, of that. And one way I think that we can all reach more people, you know, in communities of color is showing empathy, even when we might not naturally want to do that. So let's just say you are a white conservative person and let's just say you have a black, you know, progressive person or just maybe even a moderate Democrat and something happens with a, you know, George Floyd or, you know, a, a Black Lives Matter police brutality case. So I find that you can be, you can speak the truth without being unnecessarily offensive. That's a model that I live by that the truth itself is offensive. So I, if I say to, to someone, I believe in two genders, or I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, that's a very simple thing. That's offensive to people, like in and of itself. And that's enough where I don't have to just like be extra dramatic or ex, extra caustic or, or, you know, I don't have to talk about, you know, drinking liberal tears or something like that because just standing on the truth is enough to offend a lot of people. And so I can say it in a way that's, truthful, but also like respectful. So I would say when things that happen, like that are emotionally charged and people are looking to see, like, what do you think? What do you, you know, just be mindful of what you're saying and how you say it. Um, that's very important. Another thing that's important is 
finding any place where you can find common ground with people that are different than you. So, you know, you might go to an all white church, but perhaps you know that there's a particular spot in your neighborhood or a place that a lot of black people go or, you know, could you go there? I mean, the way that I started developing deep relationships with some Jewish people in my neighborhood is that I just went to their synagogue (laughs) to visit their synagogue. I thought, oh, you know, let me go over there and see what it's like. And then I developed over time this really beautiful relationship with this man named Rabbi, Rabbi Haas. And he knows a lot about the Old Testament. I mean, I would say, what do you think this means? And he knows like fluent Hebrew. So he would say, oh, well, this means this. And and then there were times when I'd be in events and he would say, oh, Christina, do you want to pray? And I would say, and then he had a real heart for unity. So he even at one time invited Christians into his synagogue to do different things. And I had to cultivate that. I had to be the uncomfortable person where obviously I'm the only black person in the entire room. I'm the only Christian in the entire room, but here I am. And I'm coming like with arms wide open. So you said you grew up in that kind of an environment, but some people never have. Mm -hmm. Some people have never been the only, I've been the only black person a million times in my life. I'm from Connecticut. I've been the only black person in the room more times than I could ever count. Maybe you've never been that person, the only white person in the room, but go into a restaurant that's mostly black, go somewhere strike up a relationship with the waitress, talk to them, you know, visit a church, you know, talk to them and don't automatically just come like, Hey, I want to help you save black babies. Cause people are like, oh, okay, that's off putting, but maybe you could help serve them in some particular way. Maybe you could say, Hey, I see you have an after school program. Hey, I see you have a, um, a food shelter. I, I'd love to volunteer, you know, once a month say, I see you have a basketball camp. Like I'd like to bring my kids to that, whatever it is. And like building bridges and then through those relationships, you know, you can have conversations and you can talk about abortion. You can talk about different things because I think that if we go straight to the issue and say, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to, you know, preach the message of life. I'm going to change hearts. Like you're not really going to get through the front door because again, there's a lack of trust. Like you have to build relationships. I spent three months in Mozambique, Africa, and it was under a white woman's ministry, Heidi Baker. But she would always talk about how American missionaries would come in and they didn't build relationships, but they got a big platform and a big truck and billboards. And they were like, here we are, like we're throwing out food and we're giving stuff. And she said people would take the food because they're hungry. So they would take the food, but there was no actual trust and relationship. But she came in, started loving on people. And now it's like she's part of their family. Like she's not just white lady from California. She's Mama Heidi. Mm -hmm. And... So our community is very welcoming. You'll notice one thing about the black community. They'll love you so much. They'll make you black. Like (laughs) like there's certain people that they're like, oh no, that's a, that's a, even my husband, he's black and his friend, his best friend, Brian is white. And he's like, Brian's black, you know? So like you can be brought in so much that like, you know, you're black in, in, in our eyes. Um, you're invited to the cookout. Like a lot of black people joke around (laughs) and say, um, but it it's all, I think it's all really based on relationship. So Find where there's an opportunity for you to build that relationship and kind of start there and know that it's 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 a long commitment. It's not like well, and, a short commitment. It's long. Well, and Christina, to that point, it's like it, make sure it's a relationship where your heart's in the right place. Right. So it's almost like missionary dating where it's like this guy's really cute, but he's really kind of rough and like he drinks a lot and he gets in fights all the time, but I think I can fix him. It's like, no, 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 no. Don't go into that relationship right. trying to figure that part of it out. So, so make sure the relationship is actually, actually real yeah. and tangible, but also understand because I'm just like, just like you, like we, we had a, kind of a serious gang problem at my high school. And I remember like the, the black guys that were in one of the gangs coming up to me saying, Kyle, you're all right, man. If you ever need us and you know what I mean, you just let me know. And I'm like, all right. But at the same time, I had redneck friends that were like, Kyle, if you're ever stuck in a ditch somewhere or you or you need, you know, need some help with this side or the other thing, let us know. And it's like, it's good to have those relationships when you're the same person, no matter who you're around. Right. right. Don't you act. Don't act, more, <laughs> right. don't act more redneck when you're around the rednecks and right. don't like act like you like music that you don't like when you're around black people. Like, right. don't do right. that. Like, just be your authentic self and let them accept you or deny you based on that. You don't want to be accepted for who you're not. And that's the one thing, like whenever you're talking to these groups of people, truth still has to be at the center of everything. And eventually 
Yeah, eventually your conversation has to get towards truth because there are certain things that you and I can disagree on that are opinions. You think red's the best color, I think blue's the best cutter. color. No, no one's right in that scenario, but what's growing in the womb of a woman there, there's no opinion on that. It's not like, oh, well, I think it's this or I think it's that. No, that is a living human being. It's not going to turn into something else based on some random trimester structure. But unfortunately for us today, I feel like we could keep going all day, Christina. Yeah. We are out of time, but I really, really appreciate you going into all this detail. Yeah. But for now, that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Uh, no, I would just tell people if they aren't familiar with live action to head over to our website, liveaction.org to our social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all the different channels. And that's a great place for people to connect with us. If you want to connect with me personally, I'm also on those different channels. Black Pro Life Woman is my Instagram account. And I think one day you should talk to my husband. That's what I wanted to tell you too. Cause he has a very okay. interesting story about when he met me being you know, not, I don't, I don't even know if he'd call himself pro-life. And now he's just like, he's like super pro-life. And he talks to guys about it in like the way that only a guy can talk to another guy. And so he's a Coast Guard veteran. Um, he went to the Coast Guard Academy here in Connecticut. And now he's on the alumni board. And so he's, you know, he's got a lot of interesting perspectives too. So well, I love that. He's got an open invitation. We we can certainly make that happen. And guys, we will have all that stuff here in the show notes. And in one other quick point, there is a way when you're talking to a man on this issue where it just does come off a little bit different. So when you're a man, like I'll speak to mixed audiences about right. this issue, there's a forcefulness and a strength that a man can have where it doesn't make the women feel crushed and doesn't make the, the men feel so convicted that they can't right. move. There's a way that you can communicate where people will be able to attach themselves to your strength without being destroyed by it. But anyway, so thank you for pulling that out there. We'll, we'll talk about it off air and see if we can make that happen. But Christina Bennett, thank you for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Christina. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got three links for you today. I've got a link to Christina's personal website, a link to her Instagram where she does a lot of her stuff on social media, and then also a link to the live action website so you can check out all the other resources that we talked about in this show. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to this show. We do appreciate it wherever you're listening to this. Please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.